Washington. I'm really happy to uh, introduce uh, a panel that's going to talk about finding your next gig, um, led by Mehmet. So go ahead and take it away. So thank you so much. Before we start, I want to uh, thank everyone on the panel. Uh, first of all, uh, we have also invited uh, several companies from Seattle, which they decided to not show up, but I will call it anyway. Uh, let's do a little bit of introduction. Let's uh, get that going. Uh, come sit in the front, guys. There's a lot of seat in the back, in the front. This is going to be interesting. Let's go. All right. So first of all, what's our goal? What's this uh, finding your next gig? thing doing in a very technical conference like Nanog. So over the past years, I have worked in multiple companies where I changed my career, I interviewed in places, and then I have hired people, a lot of people, both Microsoft, ICANN, and Yahoo. And I told myself, does everybody who go to Nanog and similar events, who could be students, who could be people who are veterans in the industry, do they understand what does it take to get employed by a large corporation. I'm not saying this is necessarily a good idea to be working for a large corporation, but I think that there's slight room for uh, you know, information share uh, when it comes to working for a large company. What does it take? What's the interview process like? What does it, what does it require to be noticed by these companies? So I want to do a quick survey. Is there any actual students in the room? Students, could you raise your hand? Yeah. All right, perfect. Thanks for joining. Thanks for joining. So this, this, is, this event is also live streamed. And we are, if there are any questions online, Brian Zhang is monitoring that. And he's going to relay those questions to us. Uh, and please do help us to get this video out uh, for your uh, fellow... Some amazing speakers here who I spent the last couple of weeks understanding and learning more about them. So this is our goal. We want to understand. We want to make sure you guys understand the process and kind of give you guys an ability to give a feedback. This is probably the first time we are doing something similar like this at Nanog. And I hope to be able to find interesting topics in upcoming Nanogs like this and present it to you. But the end goal is it's very dynamic, right? Feel free to line up, ask your questions. We want to make this very interactive. One question from you guys, or I'm going to go randomly select one of you, okay? All right, let's go. Now, a little bit of introductions. So, Mike Ballinger. I, um, I'm from Charter Communications, um, and we want to talk about how we got to our place, right? Yes. So, um, kind of interesting at Charter, I think this is a little bit of a lesson learned for everybody as well, is I think we all um, are dealing with uh, recruiting agencies in some form or fashion. And I got called by a recruiting agency for this role because um, Charter had engaged an agency to find me. They're headquartered in Stanford. They didn't have um, the connections in Denver, so they hired a local agency to do that. I happen to know that agency. The individual has always been trying to get business from me through the years, and he said, Hey, Mike, um, you'll want to return my call this time because I'm not trying to get business from you. I actually have an opportunity for you. And I was like, oh, wow. So um, that's how I came to Charter. And then I learned more about it, did my homework, and um, that's how I came there. So it's a little bit of a unique story, but i um, happy to be here. Thanks. Um, so my name's CJ. Uh, I'm from Facebook. I've been there like four years. I started as an engineer, actually. So when I started... Uh, I kind of had a recruiter find me through some online just posts. Uh, some people ask, like, hey, how do you get found? Uh, do I apply for jobs? I never would have applied for a job because I never would have thought I could work at Facebook. Um, so, you know, I took the call. I, I went on the phone, didn't think I had a chance, uh, came to on-site interviews. I thought I would just have a free flight out to San Francisco, uh, <laughs> get to see the, the city. 
uh, and it turned out working out. So for me, it was more just like by doing things online and, and contributing to the community to have somebody just kind of pick up something small and then go, hey, let's reach out to this person. So that's how I got here. Awesome. So my name is Dan Seifert. I'm at Google as a technical recruiter. I focus on the network operations world. For me, this was a pretty big career pivot. I'd actually spent the first 11 years of my career in the nonprofit sector focused on education. I worked at uh, Teach for America and then an outfit called Citizen Schools doing lots of talent acquisition stuff. So I had done plenty of recruiting, but I had never really worked in the technology space. And so for me, I took the path of going through an employee referral where I talked with someone who had worked at Google for a while, tried to learn more about the culture of the company, see if there was a place where I could fit in. And then when the time was right and we saw that there was a, an opportunity that made sense, had her submit a referral for me, and then that at least got my resume reviewed, and then, of course, you know, went through the whole process. So I've been here for a little over a year. It's been a huge learning opportunity, and I think it just reminded me again that there are a lot of, a lot of different avenues that you can use to find your way to your next role. My name is Peter. Um, I've been at Oracle for about three years now, and uh, I found out about this opportunity through, I got contacted by a, a director at recruiting at, at Oracle, and uh, my background, um, Originally started in, in tech recruiting uh, for ADASH positions at Microsoft and, uh, and then did a contract at Amazon. And, uh, and then I worked for a small manufacturing company building fitness equipment and they built a entire new fitness application, console, all that type of stuff. And so I had experience building new software teams and Oracle contacted me about an opportunity to be a part of the bare metal cloud team. And, in Seattle and uh, when they started that up. So, um, so yeah, took on that. Was really looking forward to working for a bigger company and taking on that challenge. Thank my you. name is Jeff. Um, <clears throat> I was working at an agriculture company and my contract was coming to an end. So I started networking and uh, you know I posted my resume and put it out there, but it was through LinkedIn that um, a headhunter found me. And uh, they looked at my profile, saw some of the recommendations that people had been nice enough to put up on my, my profile. And that got me uh, a meeting with the, the recruiting leadership at Yahoo. And uh, you know, I was able to go in there and find out it was a, a great environment. So um, that's, that's what got me there. All right. Thanks, thanks everyone for a quick introduction. So one thing that is important for uh, I think everyone to know that what was the background of each individual. As uh, Peter uh, mentioned, he has extensive uh, experience working at Microsoft, a Amazon, and the rest of the team. The only thing I want to call out, TJ is actually not a recruiter. He is a hiring manager. We wanted to blend it a little bit and have uh, at least one hiring manager that can give a different opinion than the talent acquisition uh, professionals. So let's go dive right in. Uh, we already talked about this, so I'm going to, t uh, to get this slide. Uh, so let's talk about, uh, you know, I will actually uh, start with you, Jeff, since we, let's go this way. Jeff, tell us, what are the top things uh, you guys are looking these days? Well, when I'm, in general, when I'm looking for any candidate, what, first and foremost, what we want to see is they have the, the core skill set that's needed for the role. And so that should be, um, that should be apparent. Um, we want to see a progression uh, in, in, in a resume or in education. And also just, a, a, you know, a, it's hard to show on a resume, but some passion for the work that you're doing. Um, if you guys are, you know, in, in school, uh, Certifications are really good. I think we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but I'm, I'm looking for someone that, you know, just has the very basic elements of the role, and that will, that will lead me to talking to them. And then it's, you know, personality, passion that makes me really want to push them through the process. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, yeah I kind of reiterate, yeah, uh, yeah obviously the first the core skill set, but I also think uh, a consistency of career path, right? You, you haven't been jumping all around doing different things. Um, you you kind of, you have a, it kind of shows a vision where you want to go, take your career. I, I think that's, that's big. And also <clears throat> work history as well, I think is, is something I pay a lot of attention to. Have they been jumping around a lot of different jobs? Have they been just doing contracts? Um, or what I like to see is they stuck with a company for maybe a couple years or a few years. And, and to me, it shows that, you know, good times are bad. You know, if they go through some different challenges of their work, they can, you know, get through that. Because every company has ebbs and flows, and, 
you know, in, in different challenges, but it shows that they can stick with the position. And then, and then when they do make a change, does it look like it makes sense for them in their career path? Does it look like it's moving, uh, if it's upward mobility, that type of stuff is, is a lot of the core things I look for in a resume. Yeah, I really want to deep dive on the, you know, resume and track record. We have some resume focused slides. So let's talk about that in more detail there. Dan. Yeah, so I think, and uh, we'll definitely come back to this in a little bit, but you know, more than anything else, I'm looking to understand what sort of the story of someone's impact has been. And so regardless of what roles you've had, you know, what have you done while you were there? What's been your big contribution? And to whatever extent you can quantify that and help us see, oh, you know, when this person showed up, we went from being able to serve you know, this many users to this many users. You know, whatever it is that you were able to add value with, that's incredibly powerful because then you know, anytime I'm trying to match a candidate with a role, I need to tell their story to the hiring manager to say, this is why you should bring this person to your team because look what they've been able to do. So I think you know, when we get to the resume part, we can dig in a bit more, but I think in general, focusing less on just what your responsibilities were and more about what your accomplishments were and sort of what you did against the expectations that were set for you, that's really powerful in setting yourself apart. Yeah, thank you for that. So uh, TJ, I know uh, very well Facebook has a very high bar when it comes to network engineers. What are some of the things as a hiring manager you look, I mean, I know for a fact that one of the requirements is that everybody has to work for Microsoft, right? To work for <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, that, that's, um, I wanted to kind of get off the resume topic slightly because as a hiring manager, I'm looking for slightly different things. Um, for me, uh, one thing that I look for is what type of stuff are you doing outside of just your job, if anything, that can always be beneficial. So are you contributing to open source? Uh, do you have blogs? Are you helping on mailing lists? Um, that type of stuff. Uh, then the other like, kind of core thing that I'm looking for in candidates, or rather I should say my team is looking for in candidates, is actual understanding of stuff. So you can write anything on your resume. Uh, you can work places, but you can have certifications. We'll touch on some of this stuff later, but you really understand the fundamentals of how things work. Um, and from there, then building onto it. Because one thing we know in our industry, everything's always going to change, but the fundamentals don't. It's just how we apply them. Uh, and we even see kind of a cyclical nature. I mean, segment routing's back, right? So uh, we, we see this as long as you understand the fundamentals. That's what I'm looking for. Absolutely. I think um, I agree with everything that everybody said here. Obviously, we have to look for the... Um, you know, the key requisites for a role. But I think on top of that, what we look for are people that are uh, forward-looking. Um, we really gauge aptitude. Um, and I think another thing that I always take a look at is um, industry knowledge. You know, it shows me how much people are engaged in not just the company, but the industry. Um, you know, how much do they know? What are the trends? Things along that nature. Um, and that helps to gauge business acumen as well. You know, so we, it helps to gauge like how, you know, how far in a career advancement we're looking for people to go, you know, right out of the gates. All right, thank you. Well, let's continue with the next question. Uh, so we want to make this interactive. I promised an interact interactive session. Do we have any questions online from video stream? Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> PTAC, do you have any questions? Woohoo! Okay, uh, Matt Petak from Yahoo. One challenge that we've talked about in this room in the past as, a, as kind of an industry overall, um, we don't see a very diverse population in the room. I mean, if we, if we were to look at kind of gender and, and ethnic balance, we're, we're pretty much a whole bunch of, of middle-aged men here, sorry to say. Um, <clears throat> one thing that we've talked about is what can we do to try to, to change that balance? As, as recruiters and people who are reaching out to bring people into the, the tech fold, do you look at trying to consciously uh, buck the trend of, wow, yet another male in the tech industry, how surprising? Do you look for minorities? Do you look for females? Are you actively trying to reflect more of what the real population diversity is, or do you just go based on, hey, they did open source stuff, they must be awesome, who cares about what gender or ethnicity they are? This is actually an excellent question, I want to thank you for that, and no, I did not pay PTAC to ask me that question, but, so, who wants to go first? I'm happy to jump in. Please. Um, so, great question. Um, it's a challenge, we know that. 
Um, and at Charter, what we do, um, we're very deliberate about our approach. Um, so part of it is, um, you know, we're, we're involved in, uh, you know, specific to our industry, WICT, you know, women in uh, communications, telecom, obviously, heavily, heavily involved. Um, you know, we just had, uh, just two weeks ago, our uh, CTO for engineering was just, um, just honored at the event. So that's great. Um, another event that we're doing is the, um, the largest um, female um, technical conference for uh, recent graduates and graduates at the Grace Hopper Conference. So, um, you know, major efforts there. But I think the biggest thing that we do um, is not just from a recruiting perspective doing it, but making sure that when we're bringing folks in, that we're deliberate in our interview approach. And that means having female executives being part of the interview teams. So we're, um, you know, we take a holistic approach at it. Very good. Anybody else wants to Yeah, I can jump answer? in. So, EJ? I mean, there's kind of two ways that I look at it. One is what can we do for the current industry? Uh, and, you know, we have efforts. I like that we have a lunch for Nanog, you know, later today that's positive start. Um, we have a lot of women in tech uh, initiatives through Facebook. I'm sure most of you have uh, read about those. I won't go into details. What I've been focusing a lot on recently is more how can we, uh, as we bring new people into the industry, how can we start changing it from there? So working with colleges, universities, uh, from that aspect to get people to um, kind of come in and um, try to change the way the industry and the makeup of diversity is. I mean, look at our panel, actually. We, even this kind of like is, is a problem, and I agree. But I think that's how I'm trying to... Uh, we're trying to uh, tackle that is kind of as we bring new people in the industry, can we bring in women, can we bring in more diverse backgrounds? Absolutely. And we noticed this when we were building this panel, just uh, for everyone's sake. We were discussing, even yesterday, still try to bring a female colleague uh, to give us this diverse opinion because that's what makes us us, right? So, uh, but I also want to hear from the Everyone from the ladies uh, in the room, if they may, go to Mike and tell us what can be done if there is any feedback that you can give uh, to make this racial uh, issue, you know, if it is an issue, uh, and I think it is an issue, uh, you know, smooth a little bit or go away. Anybody else before we move to the next question then? I mean, I think a lot of great points have already been said. The main thing is just when I, when I think about this, I always think about there's sort of the, the recruitment piece and how do we bring in more diverse populations to our organizations. But then there's also the retention and growth piece and how are we fostering a culture where people from all sorts of different backgrounds and different gender identities feel comfortable and feel like our company is a place where they can be home and feel like our industry is a place where they can be home. And so I think when we're out there not only recruiting but also just doing the work, you know, take time to think about who else should we be kind of inviting to different events and gatherings? Who should we be putting on stage? Who should we be you know, referring for opportunities at our companies? And also, how do we work with community-based organizations? So I think one of the things that um, I've been excited to do since I've been here, since I sort of came from a nonprofit background, is how do we you know, engage K-12 organizations? How do we engage STEM-focused organizations that are serving you know, students of color, that are serving girls, and get them excited about technology now and remind them that this is a place they can be and then stay in touch and work with them to hopefully find opportunities. So I think it's really a team effort and it's definitely not just about recruiting, it's about sort of how we build inclusive companies together. Thank you. Uh, Patrick? Uh, Patrick Elmore Markley. Uh, if you said this, I'm sorry I missed it, but I was actually uh, surprised that I haven't heard it so far. What do you guys think of um, working in an office, in a remote office, working from home, and then how do you handle that? Do they have to come in you know, a week, a month? Is it all Slack and you know, Skype, Google Hangouts, whatever? Or does everybody have to be in the office all the time, et cetera? That's another great question. We have a dedicated slide for that. Do you mind if we answer it when we get to that slide? Thank you, Patrick. So we are gonna move right ahead. Uh, I wanna make sure that we manage the time. You have 40 minutes left. So, what? You've got one more. One more question. All right. I can wait. One more question. Uh, Keith McGlone with Juniper Networks. I want to know how you guys address a gap in technical background. Let's say they have some of the fundamentals, but they're missing a couple of things. Let's say it's automation. Maybe I don't know Go. Maybe I don't know Python. What do you guys do to address the gaps that you know you want in a candidate? 
He's saying like if um, you're missing a key skill set, but otherwise you show high potential as a candidate. Let's, let's say the fundamentals are good, but you want, you want automation. And maybe you're doing automation with Python, and I don't know Python. What do, you got, what do you guys do for that candidate to help get them up to speed? Because I think that's a, that's a hurdle for a lot of people. Well, um, I've been fortunate enough to, to partner with hiring managers that when they see or talk to a candidate that has incredibly high potential but is maybe missing one key element, they'll, they'll say, okay, we can't move forward with you right now, but we're going to call you in six weeks, and we want to bring you back in and talk to you again. Use those six weeks to really learn the basics of that, that element that you were missing. And if you can come and show that you've been able to grasp you know, the, 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 the fundamentals of it and um, that you're able to teach yourself and find ways to learn, that's enough. That's, that shows you know, the qualities that go far beyond just having already used it a couple of times. That's a, that's a very interesting one. Uh, at, at some point in the past, uh, one of the requirements that I was trying to hire for as a hiring manager required a security certification. And the, the candidate was absolutely phenomenal, except missing that certification. And we said, you go get it, and we will offer you a job. And he actually did. It, it showed some dedication as well. So that was a good example. Thanks for the question. Uh, we are going to move on if there are no further questions. And there will be another section for further questions. All right, so this is the slide that I believe we are going to take most of our time. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about common things that you observe when you see pre during and post interview. And I want to do it like one round of pre interviews and one round of post interview, during interviews and post, if that's okay with you guys. Sure. So why don't we start with you? Yeah. Um, pre interview. I, I think on the, on the pre side, I, um, the biggest piece is do, do your homework. Not just on the company, do your homework on the industry. Um, if you are um, networked into your role, make sure that you're talking to people within the company. Um, any contacts that you have, because one thing you're going to see, we're all from big companies here, is there's an overall company culture. And you can read that on the website, and there's all of those pieces. But there's always um, somewhat of a subculture within that group as well. You know, so although it's following the guidelines of the company, it can be a little bit different. You know, some, some groups are a little bit more um, creative, forward-looking, all of that. But just understanding what you're getting into beforehand and make sure you have, um, you're prepared for the interviews. I think um, we've talked about this yesterday. Um, you know, understand who you are meeting with. You know, especially in your interviews. If you're meeting with a recruiter, then you can talk about the culture. If your next step is meeting with, you know, the hiring manager or somebody that's a peer, or if it's more of a technical interview, know your audience and prepare for that appropriately. Yeah, usually when, um, before the interview starts, when you're working with your, your recruiter, they're going to try to help you. You should be partnering with them. As a hiring manager, I know I spend a lot of time with my recruiting team and trying to explain to them what we're looking for, and they understand what's going to happen during the interview process. So listening to what they're trying to, to say to you and, and help you along is good. Uh, the other thing that I see that can, I don't want to say harm, but if candidates come and don't do any prep work for interview, that can also uh, be a little bit detrimental. You need to show that you're willing to try to learn or try, almost like getting ready or studying for the interview per se, but uh, like I mentioned before, it's more about the core skills and being able to apply the knowledge. If you can study and just um, you know, give me all the steps of the BGP decision process, it's not really going to be useful. But if I ask you, hey, if, why do you think this step is before that one, and you can give me an insightful answer, those are things to prepare for and think about. Yeah, I'd agree with a lot of what's already been said. I think um, preparing for the interview process involves, I think, both you know, studying some of the core knowledge required, but also sort of practicing how you deliver what you know in an interview setting where you know obviously it is kind of artificial time is limited resources are limited and so you've got to figure out how do you express what you know and know how to do in a really clear and concise way and I honestly think like a lot of things the best way to do it is to practice and so either find someone where you are that you trust and who could maybe 
be sort of like a mock interview buddy, find, you know, someone who's just a friend of yours at another company and say, hey, could you talk to me like you were talking to a candidate at your company since I'm thinking about maybe making a move and get some feedback and find out, like, did that answer actually make sense? Did it convey what you were hoping to convey? You could even ask someone, like, what did you take away from that two or three minutes that I just, you know, spoke? And if they're not taking away the things that you were expecting them to, it's an opportunity to go retool and think about okay, how do I talk about that big project or how do I talk about um, you know, this technical topic? So I think like anything else, practice makes perfect. Yeah, <clears throat> to, to piggyback that too, you know, preparation. You know, when <clears throat> someone, when you're standing up at a whiteboard, it's, it feels a lot different than when you're on the phone or, or sitting down in front of somebody. So I think that's a huge thing is just getting comfortable standing up, whiteboarding stuff, you know, if it's with, <clears throat> you know, friends or whoever. <clears throat> and then also know your resume inside and out be able to talk about everything on it in detail. And, uh, you, you know, because there's, there's words on there that are open game. And, and managers are going are gonna to pick on that stuff and they're going to peel the onion and, and really see how much depth and knowledge and, and, and stuff that you know. But, but yeah, it's, it's all about preparation is the biggest things and being comfortable talking about the stuff that you know. I would say, um, and maybe this is a bit of a pet peeve, but don't, don't shotgun every single job under the engineering banner and apply to every single one. You know, pick the ones that you think you're a fit for, and it's okay to overshoot a little bit, but if I go in and see somebody and it, their name is attached to every single requisition um, in the engineering department, then I don't feel like they have a focus or a passion. And I want to see people that are pursuing something that they're really interested in because that's what's going to help get them through the process. So be selective um, and learn as much as, about, as you can about the company, about the people. Like Lee said, take it to Stalker and then just back it up a notch or two so that um, <laughs> you really know who you're, you're talking to. You know some information about the, the hiring manager, where they came from, what their interests are, what school they went to. It's all stuff that's going to help you have a good conversation with them. Yeah, don't, don't be afraid to ask the recruiter lots of questions just to help prepare. Yeah. Everybody touch base uh, very, very important uh, areas. One thing that I want to also cover is actually finding the job and correct way to engage for applying. You, you touch base, a great point. Don't apply everything on the website. What do you guys see social media, and if I may qualify LinkedIn as a social media, I guess I can. Uh, how, what, what is the most common way you see a candidate to come to your vision, uh, to, 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 to you to actually see? Is it through referrals? Is it LinkedIn? Is it Twitter? Is it Facebook? What, what, what do you, how do you guys receive candidates usually? Uh, for... For us at Charter, the majority is going to be through LinkedIn and um, referrals. Thank you. Know, so, you know, through our employer referrals. Yeah. Those are going to be our preferences as well. Referrals are always, you know, highly regarded. They, they still have to go through the full process, but they're going to get seen. You know, we, we, we owe that to the, the employees that made the referral. And, um, you know, hopefully they're referring quality people, so we want to give them the, the shot to at least be seen. And if you know somebody, you know, chances are, especially if you're looking at a bigger company, you're going to know somebody that works there. You're going to know somebody that knows somebody that works there. And most companies have referral bonuses, so, you know, exploit those uh, to some degree so that you get in, you have an advocate, you have a cheerleader while you're going through the process. I mean, employee referrals are definitely very important, um, but I don't want to, everybody's already been saying that. Um, you know, LinkedIn searches are normal. Um, I don't do much of those myself. As a hiring manager, I'm more, I might be reading something interesting on a blog, or I might be on a Slack or in IRC or talking to somebody there, um, using software and seeing who is kind of contributing to that. That's where I might find people, or even running into people like anywhere, like it could be a conference like this, or it could be um, just out, at the bar or something, like unrelated to a conference at all. It's more just talking to people and communicating and networking and then finding common interests that way and then seeing if they're interested. Dan, I hope you're not searching your candidates in Google+. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> No comment. Um, so I think, you know, for us, because you asked about, like, you know, social media outreach strategies, um, I think, you know, one thing I see a lot, and I think this is just across a lot of different companies, is sort of folks either 
sending a message on some platform or just you know writing in the comments section like, hey, would love to work with you at some point. Please review my profile. And that's not super helpful because what I'm then wondering is like, okay, but for what? Like, what would actually be exciting to this person? Where do their skills fit in? What's so much more helpful is if someone reaches out and says, hey, I saw that it looks like this team is hiring or this role is available. I think I could be a good fit because of X, Y, Z. Would you be up for a chat? I almost always respond to those outreaches because that at least shows me this is someone who puts a lot of thought into what they do. And even if this isn't a perfect fit, like that's definitely the someone that I want to be in touch with. So do you actually see that LinkedIn and receiving a message, such message in LinkedIn is actually something that you would respond and then kind of develop upon? And you know, if someone's taken the time to actually write a really thoughtful, tailored message to me, you know, I may need a little bit of time to get back to all of them, but I, I'm going to go out of my way to respond to those, where if it is clearly just kind of like mass outreach, that's probably not going to be prioritized. And I think candidates probably feel the same way. Like if you just get a boilerplate message from a recruiter saying, we're looking for this kind of engineer, and you're like, I haven't done that ever. Um, like, why would you respond to that? So similarly, like if, you know, if write the kind of message to a recruiter that you would want to receive from one, and most of the time you're going to get a response. We had a question, but they sat down. Do we have a question? We can take one question before we proceed. All right, let's get the name. Thank you. Uh, Matt Ringel, Akamai. Um, in terms of when you talk about do your homework, you know, on the people you're talking to, et cetera, et cetera, you said, you know, okay, stalker then back it off a couple of notches. But the question I have is from the other side, what homework would you expect somebody to do on the people that they'd be interviewing with? In general, what, what do you think are the table stakes for, like, when you see, okay, you're given the interview slate, what would you expect the interviewer, uh, the interviewee, to actually do the homework on? That's a great question. Actually, this might, and th this might seem silly, but know what the company does. Um, and if it's a larger company and you're interviewing for a specific uh, business unit within that company, know what they do. You know, have, have just a, at least a basic understanding of what that group does, what their product is, what their projects are, as much as you can figure out. Um, but I've had people come in and their first question is, so what do you guys do anyway? And that just doesn't start the conversation on a good foot. Maybe um, if I may add something is, if you have the list of people, perhaps do a quick LinkedIn search. Try to see maybe the schools these individuals went, the, the career path they took, which might be similar to yours. And then you can relate to conversations while you're interviewing. I have had someone tell me something about my soccer refereeing or the fact that I lived in Puerto Rico for several years. It kind of you know, jump starts you in a very positive way and gets your, you know, unique attention for, for a certain period of time. And I think it's a good idea to get to know these kind of details. But what else? One of the things that we're gonna, we were gonna talk about later, but, you know, coming, I guess during, I was gonna talk about this, but during the process, having questions for people that you're interviewing with, you can use that researcher when you're looking into who the people are to come up with questions you might wanna ask them. Like, hey, I saw that you did this. Um, why or digging into things like that. I would use that type of thing to maybe tailor questions for people. Yes. Yeah, and use this, your recruiter to, to answer some of those early yeah. questions about what the company does or what the project team does. Make sure that um, you, you feel like the recruiter shared enough information with you that you can go in there with just at least a basic understanding of what, what the team does. Yeah, and building on that, I mean, I'm always <clears throat> really clear with candidates on what kind of interview you're walking into, and if you're, you know, your recruiter hasn't been for some reason, by all means, ask them. But um, you know, I'm really clear on this is going to be a deep dive on technical knowledge. So yeah, if you you know have something in common with the interviewer, great. But there probably isn't going to be a lot of small talk here. This is really digging into technical brass tacks. Whereas you know, <laughs> especially later in the process, this may be like a fit call with a hiring manager, and you guys are going to meet over coffee, and it's going to be much more about could you two work well together? And so that's obviously going to have a much different vibe and you're going to want to ask much different kinds of questions and be you know, prepared to answer different kinds of questions. So I think you know, certainly ask your recruiter and then also it's never a bad idea to actually like as part of your prep, maybe come up with a list of what you're hoping to learn about the company, actually like write it down. This is what I did before my last interview. And then as you go through your you know, on-site day, Try to check off each of those questions. Maybe ask like a couple from each person, depending on what it seems like they're an expert in. And then by the end of the day, you know they've gotten a really clear picture of you, but you've also gotten a really clear picture of them. One thing you mentioned about <clears throat> looking at one thing I did is uh, 
for a job a long time ago, I actually took the job description and every line item that they're required, I wrote down what my experience was doing the exact same thing or similar. So if they did ask me a question, I could say, you know, I've never done that, but here's something I've done that's similar. So that, that's one thing that helped me. Just take the job description, go down line by line. What have I done? And then I could give examples to them during the interview. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you. Yeah. With this, let's dive directly into during and, you know, maybe go right into a post afterwards. So uh, there can be a lot of things that's going wrong during an interview. You were scheduled to meet with one of the top engineers. Last minute, the person is sick, scheduling errors, there's something late, running late, there's a big attack, DDoS attack going on, or some security bug, people need to patch, there's a priority change. This should not demotivate you if you are on site and motivate, uh, and, uh, and you know, like kind of not motivated because suddenly your interview is changing. This is a common thing that I have observed in every company I was part of. Uh, I want to say this uh, because I see a lot of candidates kind of you know, feeling uh, bad during the interview. That's one of the common issues. But what else? What else we can uh, talk about during? I think uh, during, I mean, we're all with big companies. Um, you know, we talked about this yesterday as well, but the be patient. You know, I, it's sometimes there's a lot of process. There's a lot of steps that need to be had. There's um, approvals that need to happen to keep moving up. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't move the pace a little bit faster if we need to. So what I always ask of um, people that are interviewing is be very transparent. Let us know what's going on. If you're interviewing with somebody else and you have an offer forthcoming or you might have an offer in hand, it might help us move the needle a little bit faster too. So just that open transparency helps the recruiter so much. Yeah, I want to, I want to talk a little more like during the interview, like when you're actually interviewing with people. I find it's really important to be honest with the people you're interviewing with. Don't make up things as you go along <laughs> when you're trying to answer questions. Actually explain what your knowledge is. Because when you're interviewing, people are trying to understand what you know and how you can be in addition to the team and how your skills will help. So being honest about what you know and answering the questions that way is important. However, you can also qualify, I'm not sure, but this is how I think it works, and then go down that path, which can then not only help you out by, you know, you can have that conversation and maybe it's a little bit back and forth, like why do you think that way? But it can also show that you have like the critical thinking to be able to, well, I don't know for sure, but this might be how it works. Uh, and that can be a, a good signal to give for kind of potential and learning and all kinds of things like that. Absolutely, no, I think being, you know, honest and humble about what you don't know is always a great signal to send. It shows you know the kind of person that can grow and develop. Um, I think the other thing is really don't shy away from details, especially if you're in a technical conversation Take it as an opportunity to shine in your area of depth. You know, we don't expect any one person to know everything, but we want to know, you know, what you know in a particularly like deep way. And so use this as a way to show that off. And you know, I think some of the times that candidates haven't worked out, you know, the overall sentiment from hiring managers was, well, they stayed like really high level. They were, you know, a little bit hand wavy with some of the details. And so take some time to really study, um, you know, the really brass tacks mechanics of whatever it is that you're going to be talking about and then make sure that you really walk them through all of that and then at the end of your answer you can always say like did that give you what you were looking for would some more depth help most interviewers are not looking to trick or trap you they're looking to understand what you know and if you've gotten like almost there but not quite they'll tell you they'll say well could you actually share a bit more about that and then that's a good signal to go you know deep into that and make sure they understand where you really would add expertise to their team even if the technology isn't like for example, if you're really deep in OSPF and this company doesn't use OSPF, it's still okay to show that. It shows that you know something in depth. Uh, and maybe you can even teach that interview or something, and then they can go and double check it later or whatever. But uh, it doesn't matter if it's the exact technology needed. It's just showing that you could learn something that deep because you're going to have to learn something else anyways. That's Absolutely. been some of the highest praise I've seen interviewers give a candidate as they come out and said, I could learn from this person. They could teach us how to do this. We need this skill set in the company. We don't have it. So, you know, demonstrate your expertise. Um, one thing I wouldn't talk about during the interview process with the interviewers, with the hiring manager, is, is stay away from the comp portion. Uh, talk to your HR person, your recruiter about that. When you're in the interview and 
it's technical, you're, you're trying to learn about the culture, the team, uh, the projects, all that, stay on that track. Um, we can talk comp later if uh, we, we probably already talked about it before yeah, you've gone into that. Um, we don't want you to waste your time, but at the same time, we want you to get the most out of the interview, and that can derail it, and really the hiring managers don't have a lot of say over that. They have influence, but there's so many other elements, so it, it, it's a bit of a, it's a waste of your interview time to try and have that, that conversation. You guys might disagree, but I think that's a better conversation to have with the recruiter. And just kind of add a little bit more, um, feedback I hear quite a bit is some candidates go in when they're doing problem solving or something, they make too many assumptions. They don't really um, ask a lot of clarifying questions, really dig to the root of the problem that the interviewer's you know, trying to get solved. So that, that's a, a big thing I hear back. Also, yeah, a lot of, um, you know, lack of better way, just they try to I guess BS their way through certain answers and stuff like that too. Um, it's another thing. And then also, I've, I've seen this in the past, like they bring up personal stuff. Do not bring up any personal stuff. If, if, if this or that is going on in your life, interviewer really, you know, just focus on, you know, being professional. It's, you know, getting through the interview, you know, answering the questions, getting your questions answered. And you know, just try to keep some of the personal things out of it. And that's a good point. You use your recruiter for a buffer, you know, because they, they can feed all of that and then they can communicate it back to the hiring manager in the appropriate manner. Yeah. That's a great thing that you just mentioned, use your recruiter, because in this process, recruiters actually work both ways. Yes, they are employed by a certain company, but do understand recruiter's main job to attract you. Recruits, recruiter's main job is to bring you in. And for them, success is bringing the best talent they possibly can. Uh, so thanks for uh, you know, touching bases on that. So we got through the interview. We were all excited. I went home. It passed three days. I'm not hearing back. What kind of sign is that? Three days, four days. And just one thing I want to mention. We have very well respected companies here represented. We are trying to generalize. So we are not trying to see what Google does, what Facebook, what you know, the rest of the companies does. But we are trying to generalize. And if you notice the, the kind of message we are trying to give up at this scale, at this large 100,000, uh, you know, 10,000, 20,000 employee companies, how the process works. So I just want to make sure that it's very clear the answers we give it's slightly vague, but it's very accurate within the, within the scale. So, okay, I went through my interview. I think it went really, really well. I haven't heard anything from the recruiting team. What kind of sign would that be? TJ. Uh, well, I guess I think of it in two different ways. One, let's say it's from you know, a, a phone conversation to an on-site conversation. Um, one thing that, like, a bad signal that I'll get from a candidate is if we ask a question on a phone screen and they don't know, that's okay. But if they didn't go learn it and study it and understand it and come on site and then still can't answer the question, that's kind of a bad signal. But to answer your more exact question. That's a good one, actually. Let's capture that for, for the, so if you guys are asked a question in a phone interview, make sure you actually did an answer, you learn it, because it might be asked again. That's a very smart one, actually. Wow. But to your actual question on like what kind of signal is that, I mean, it, it, one, I would talk to your recruiter because your recruiter should be staying in constant conversation. Maybe they're waiting for the feedback. It could be that, to your point, the process, you know, some companies only meet every week or maybe even every two weeks to review candidates uh, unless there's some sort of time issue that needs to be uh, pulled in. It could also be that the people doing the interview, and, and I hate to say it, but maybe they're late entering their feedback. And that delays the process. Um, I don't want to call anybody out, but that can happen. So sometimes I also don't want to call anybody out. I think what I um, what I always tell candidates is, and my recruiting team, you know, I, I tell them, you know, um, set the level set with candidates when they um, finish their last interview. You'll hear from me, you know, by this date, whether I have any details for you or not. You know, so right. then that communication is there. It's comforting to the candidates just even having a connection there. Um, I think what also is okay is, as a candidate, ask, when should I hear back from you? And if I don't, is it okay if I, you know, 
reach out to you, then, you know, to your point where you kind of take that stalker thing back just a hair, right? <laughs> um, so I think it's okay and it's appropriate on both sides. Yeah, in respect to time management, I just want to ask a very general question because this is something that might not be very clear for everyone. The process of hiring depends on the size of a company very much. If you're working for a 20-person startup, you might be hired within a matter of hours because the process is very agile, very small company, they don't have to follow a lot of things. But how is that process like? And I don't want anyone to really just go and deep into there, but like, I know for a fact, it takes somewhere between three months, average three months, for a web scale company process to be starting from the day that you actually engaged and ask about the job, either someone that you know in that company or talk to, uh, the recruiter first time around till you actually get a job offer. Would you guys agree high level with this three months bold statement that I'm making? I mean, I think it just varies so much. And I think, I know we keep coming back to this idea, but this is where just really transparent communication with your recruiter can be so helpful because, you know, one of the things I always try to understand is everyone is in a different place when they're applying for a job. And some people are looking at lots of things at once. Some people are only looking at one particular thing and are being you know, very selective about that one job. And so they may have more time. I always try to understand that up front. And if you're someone that needs to move really fast, I'll do everything I can to try and make our process work for you. And I'll also just be really honest, like, here's the absolute fastest we can go. Does that work for you? And if it doesn't, you know, let me know, and if we just have to you know, stay in touch with something down the road, that's totally fine. But if we can make it work, I'll try. And so I think, yes, it, it can sometimes take that long, but it can also go a lot faster. And it mostly depends on the role, the team, the candidate. It's a lot of different variables, and the solution to all of it is just you know, being really transparent both ways. Yes. yes. I think that time frame is pretty accurate. I think, um, you know, but if, like he said, if Dan said, if you... Um, update us on your urgency, we can update the urgency of the process to a certain degree. So just be very open what your situation is and, and why it maybe has changed. And hopefully I've, uh, and these guys have set the expectation with you of how long it's going to take and keeps you posted throughout the process. I, I, yeah, you, you got to be persistent though, I, I think. I mean, because I don't know what kind of workload you guys have, but um, it definitely helps us recruiters if you're following up with us yeah. because it keeps keeps us in the keeps you in the forefront of our mind that I need to keep on this hiring manager because he's slow to get feedback to us or is the interview team slow to be feed, get feedback to us and I, I owe this guy feedback so don't be afraid to be persistent um, just below the stalker yeah <laughs> but so there's one specific question I'm just gonna ask TJ but everyone else is welcome to answer as well I'm also trying to manage the time so I went to re-interview I thought my interview went really well. I decided a not positive response. Does that mean I can never work for that company again? Oh, uh, and again, it's back to talking with your recruiter, but um, what you're looking to do there is get the feedback on what didn't go well. And, and typically the people either that you interviewed with or maybe the recruiter that you're working with will give you that feedback. Like, you know, you need to get better in scripting or like, this area, you kind of made some stuff up. Maybe you should understand that better or, or that type of stuff. But we can revisit candidates. I think we mentioned this earlier, like, hey, if you don't know this, maybe come back in six weeks or two months or three months or whatever time frame you need. Uh, we might even go, hey, you know, this area you need to get a little bit stronger in, maybe find something on the side or find a project where you can build that skill and then come back and let us know when you're ready. Uh, and, you know, if you come back in a day or two, I might not believe you, but <laughs> uh, but you you could be surprising. But usually, just take your time, learn the area that you needed to to get stronger in, and then come back, and then we can reevaluate. I think another important thing to realize from that perspective as well is no, you didn't miss out on your chance because we're all working at very very large companies. I mean, just within uh, networking ops and engineering alone, we have like 700 open positions. So I. You know, I partner with the other groups, and you know, so we look at one holistic candidate pool. So no, that by no means, yes. you know, knocks somebody out. Yeah, that's out. a good point because maybe you're missing an area for the particular role or team you're interviewing with, but you might be a good fit for a different area. Yeah. And then, you know, I know our recruiting teams kind of talk together, like you're mentioning, and 
well, this candidate's actually really strong and, and maybe this hiring manager is looking for that skill. This is going to be actually my next question to, to the rest of the team. Let's say hiring manager said, well, this is not a right fit for my team, but this candidate could be a good fit for this other team. What is the other hiring manager's attitude when they know a peer of them or some other different team didn't find the candidate uh, very, you know, like the right candidate for that team. How do they approach to that candidate? Are there, or is it like a fresh start or any, any kind of feedback you can share on that? No, I mean, this, this happens a lot. And I think, you know, we're cognizant of the fact that every role is different. And, you know, especially the more niche or specific that a role is, um, the more likely that someone who didn't necessarily work for that could be awesome in any number of other jobs. And so I think, you know, generally that's looked at really positively where it's okay. like, hey, this person could be good for our company. It just wasn't quite the perfect fit for this team. So, you know, depending on the case, obviously this is a classic, your mileage may vary situation, but it may be we then just need to have a couple of follow-up interviews. It may be a whole other loop, but the, you know, the focus is, let's focus now on learning what we need to learn to see if this role could be a fit, even if that one wasn't. I encourage Excellent. the hiring managers to talk to each other, even from different groups. Excellent. Excellent. Well, let's move right on. We have some slides. So we have 10 minutes left. I want to leave some time, and we're going to do this slightly faster than we planned. <laughs> well, just let's go around, do some... What, not, what is absolutely one thing that you say you, ha you should do in your resume and what's one thing that you say don't do this in the resume that you see a lot? One thing I encourage people to do on their resumes, especially if you're coming from a small company, um, a startup company, or maybe a specialized consulting company, we can't possibly know every company that's out there. Explain what that company does on your resume. Just put, you know, just a quick description of that and it's extremely helpful and it helps to align your skill set you know, to the job that you're applying for. You know, it's very helpful. Anything not to do? Um, Don't lie. Yeah. That's one thing, right? Yeah. If it's too busy and it's hard to read, it, you lose interest very fast. That's a good one. You know, if so, it is too long, right? Yeah. Too busy. Yeah, I mean, everything has to be relevant in there. But if it's just um, like your font's too big or your font's too small or it's, to right, don't use different colored fonts. I can't stand that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, for me, I guess when I'm looking at a resume, it might be a little later in the process than some of the other people up here. But you know, I'm just looking for what type of technology you have on there. And when I'm looking at a resume, if you're going to have something on there, um, you know, you should only put it there if you really do know it. I guess yep. it's kind of a do and a don't. Do put things you know. Don't put things you don't know. Because you're going to get asked the question, um, you know, if you put, I know Python, and you don't know anything about it, don't put it on there. Yeah. Just using it once doesn't really count. Fair enough. Point. Yep. No, I would build on that, and so I'll, I'll go with the, the don't first. I think, like, I see a lot of folks who have sort of a big section that just says skills, and there are all these buzzwords in there. And I know, for, you know, some people may be playing sort of the applicant tracking system game where it's like, I want to make sure my resume gets read totally understand that. I'd say, you know, at, at most of the companies here, I think for the most part, resumes do get read. And when they do, you know, if it's just a big block of text, my question is then, okay, like, but what is this person really awesome at? And if it's just like a whole big group of skills, you can't tell and neither can the hiring manager. So I think instead, to go to the do, focus on what you are awesome at. Focus on where your expertise is and then include like really clear snippets of what you've done with that. So what's been your impact in using Python to maybe automate workflows and how did that actually improve the efficacy of your team? If you can show that in a resume, that's going to get a call back because then we want to say, cool, how can you do that for us? Yeah, put your passion on the resume. Yeah. That's what you should do. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> Most of the time, I don't know about you guys, but I open up a resume, I can tell within a couple seconds yeah. right away. I'm like, hey, this, this is probably a good, this 90% of the time I can tell this is going to be a good candidate or this is like, oh my gosh, all I just see is words and words and words and words and like, what hasn't this person done? I mean, that's the biggest thing. you like, what hasn't this person done? So yeah, just kind of piggyback on them. Just straight to the point on what you've done, what you've owned, you know, the, what technologies that you're good at. Um, make it readable. Have your friends look at it, and, and it's like you got your name, you got your app, you know your your contact information, the company you work for. Use maybe use hyperlinks if it's a small company, yeah. so I can just click on it, go straight to the website. Okay, they make these widgets, um, you know. The, and then obviously have some of the common sense stuff. You know, if you, I think if you're a fresh college grad, put your education first, and some of your, you know your 
if your master degree projects and then get some of your work history down below that. If you have experience, I think you swap it, put your experience first and then education at the bottom. I don't think you need to put a, a references available upon request. You can leave that off your resume. Yeah. yeah. Stole mine. Skills and hobbies is important now. All right. <laughs> I was going to say that the same thing is um, for, for the, the students and the, and the new grads. List out the projects you've worked on and how you use the technologies in those projects because, um, and any internships that you've done, list out the projects. Make sure you, you put details in what you did and, and what you accomplished um, because that's your, that's your experience and that's what we're gonna dive into. Uh, the don'ts, um, in, unless you're a, a PhD with all kinds of publications that I need to know about, two pages is about all I really wanna see with most of your relevant work up at the top. You know, you can, you can say you did it at other jobs, but you don't have to repeat verbatim all the, the skill sets you used at each job. You know, just have it at the top and say, see above, or don't, don't do that. But, um, you know, just, just have it in one spot, and that, that'll be enough. All right. Let's get right on. Hard, we, we kind of talk about this a little bit. Uh, hard to fill roles and responsibilities. What is, so we have a lot of people watching this. This is year 2017 for the <laughs> ones that are gonna watch in the future. What is hot these days? I guess automation is really hot. DevOps skills are really hot. Uh, is there any specific skill set, specialty you can just, that comes to your mind when you see this question? Is it Python just standing up? Is it? What comes to my mind is don't look for a unicorn. Not everybody can know everything, but what we want to find is what you're good at and that you have the potential to learn more. So hard to fill kind of roles and responsibilities if you think of it on like what skills you need to have. Like you can't have every skill, but demonstrate how you can learn those skills. So when then you come, you can learn them. I, I completely agree with that, TJ. It, um, and then it's, you know, aptitude always comes into play too. And, you know, with some of these hard to find skills too, are you willing to get that experience or that certification on your own? How, 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 how much are you willing to, how far are you willing to go? Yeah, speaking of certification, we are going to get to certification questions. Who has any kind of certification? Cisco Juniper here. Let's just do a quick review. Who is active, GN, CIE, CCA, all those, like it doesn't have to be GN, CIE, but like Juniper certified something, any level is fine. Could you raise your hand, please? Could you raise your hand for Cisco? Could you raise for the other <coughs> network brands that I don't know? <laughs> all right, perfect. So a lot of people actually, how do you guys see the value of getting a certification? And I wanna start this one with TJ as a hiring manager. Sorry, putting you too much on the spot today. That's okay. Uh, I think I'm just gonna kind of say what I've already been saying. The certification kind of shows that you can achieve something and get something, which is good, especially if you're maybe starting off. But really, it's not going to show that you understand the technology. It's gonna show that you understood it to some extent, but do you really understand what you're learning? And can you apply it? So. If I ask you a question that takes the knowledge that you will have learned on the certification and makes you apply it to a different scenario, can you do that or not? You're not gonna learn that from the certification. So I think it's a good way as like leading you into what base knowledge I should understand, but it's not gonna be everything. Yeah. Could we anonymously agree on this so I can move to the, the next question or anything else? <laughs> or, or anything else you want to add that's different? No, I mean, I think like just quickly on the last question, I think, you know, certainly, networking professionals who are software savvy, I think generally have more and more options. I think, uh, you know, building on TJ's point, demonstrating how you've added skills to your toolkit over time and what you've done with those. So if your resume sort of tells the story of, I started out here, this is what I learned, this is what I did, then I went here, this is what I learned, this is what I did with it. If, if you're able to show that consistently, that gives everyone involved in the process a lot more confidence that you know, even if this person isn't 100% of the way there, they're absolutely someone we should invest in because look at what they've already been able to do with new knowledge. One, I, one thing that I hear sometimes from candidates, or I've even said this myself, you know, I don't have time to go learn that. And I, I don't think that's always true. You always have time to do anything you want to put your time into. So sometimes you just need to decide what you're gonna drop to then go learn that thing that you need to put time to Prioritize. Yeah. It is very important pre, during, and post interview to ask the questions, especially the right questions. It demonstrates 
enthusiasm, it demonstrates knowledge, and it demonstrates that you actually care. Uh, what are some of the, uh, this is going to be the last question, what are some of the favorite questions you were asked or you ask the candidates? Either way, we can do it either way. And right after that, we're going to move with the questions. Danny is looking at me. You're running out of time. We are cutting. OK. So let's just go with this and maybe. I like when candidates ask me about culture. It shows that they're really invested in the role. and They want to know as much about the company as possible. I like it when uh, candidates ask about the business. You know, they read a news article, say, for instance, two weeks ago, Verizon made a bid to try to buy a charter. You know, and they ask about what's going on with that. And I love that. It's inquisitive. You know. Yeah, I love when someone asks me, you know, if we were sitting around a table a year from now, sort of doing our first, like, annual review, what would an awesome first year look like? What would a really successful first year look like? Because then great. that gives me a chance to talk about, you know, hopefully what sort of journey we're going to go on together. That is a great question. Yeah, I'm, I'm usually looking for candidates to ask me, like, what's expected of them. That's good to know. Like, what do you expect me to do, or what will I be doing when I join this team? Perfect. Peter. Yeah, I mean, you guys pretty much took a lot of stuff I was thinking, too. But I typically just ask, what are you interested in doing? That's the go-to favorite question I always ask. And then it kind of really starts to get them to maybe open up. Right. We are going to wrap up, but I promised uh, this question to be answered real qu quick about work from home, working location. You have an amazing candidate, cannot relocate, very, has some restrictions. How do you guys approach to that? So I think this is where my advice would just be, this is one of the factors you should all consider, I think, when you're deciding what companies you want to look at, because every company is different about this. And if you talk to your recruiter, they'll, they'll be honest with you, is this a work from home company or not? And so in some cases, we've had to you know, not make a match with a really great candidate just because location didn't work out. But we're honest about that up front. We stay in touch. And then hopefully at some point, you know, we can find a way to make the match work for them as well as for us. Yeah, I think it's part of know the company. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Cool. Anybody, anybody else? Any, la any last 10 second statements? Because this guy is about to pull me off the stage. <laughs> 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Any last words? Just form a good relationship with your recruiter. Yeah. Have an open dialogue. Really agree. They'll help you out. They'll advocate for you. Um, and uh, that, 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 yeah, do that. The biggest thing I think I would have is just always be learning. Don't, don't stay still. Always be learning. Yeah, and then building on that, I think, sort of keep a running log of all the cool stuff you've done and like what your accomplishments have meant for your team, for your company. And then whatever you need to update your resume, it writes itself because you've got this log of awesomeness that you've built for yourself. Great point. Cool. Well, I would like to thank everyone, Dan, Peter, Jeff, TJ, and Mike for uh, joining us today on the stage and everyone who has cut their social last night early and showed up at 10 a.m. Thank you very much.